you see it now? Yes. Okay. Um, do you have a pointer or anything? Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no, we, we see this. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon. Well, good evening, actually. Well, for us, uh, this is the last talk of the day. So it's my pleasure to have you, Enrique Tuasua from Ellangen. He's going to speak about neural ODEs, control, and machine learning. So please, Enrique, okay, go ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Dante. Thank you all for being still there. It's quite late. Thank you, especially to Kirsten and, and Lars uh, for taking care of building up this, this workshop. Hopefully next time we will meet all together there. And um, also I take this opportunity to congratulate the ladies in the, in the room or listening because today is the International Day of Human, Human in Mathematics. And, uh, and I'll also like to thank the colleagues of the Parallel Workshop, Parallel or Perpendicular, I don't know, um, <laughs> that, uh, that also join you know, uh, this lecture. Okay, so let me let me tell you uh, briefly things that you probably know, but actually that I discovered all, only very late. Actually, I think it took me 30 years to discover that this paper was ever published. Uh, this was published back in 89 in the in the journal Math Control Signals and Systems. If I am not wrong, Lars is the editor in chief or one of the editors in chief of this journal, is the person that is writing it actually. Not at um, that time, right? <laughs> huh? Not at yeah. that time. Not at that time. I think it was launched by maybe people like Eduardo Sontag and Willens, and I mean, people that were, you know, mentioned several times during this workshop for their pioneering contributions. But I mean, I confess that I think I learned about the existence of this paper last year. So during 30 years, despite being a person that has been trained in functional analysis, right? Uh, PD applied functional analysis, numerical analysis, approximation theory, to some extent control and so on. I never heard of this paper. Uh, I think it was here in Erlangen when I was giving a lecture that someone, I think probably Daniel Tembrick or so, who also pointed out the possible link between tarpike theory in control and, and, and the behavior of deep neural networks, uh, someone pointed this paper to me and I found it very, very beautiful. It actually makes a, an excellent uh, master exercise in functional analysis. So what Sivenko says in this uh, universal approximation theorem, I think is not the first one in this class. Uh, there is actually a very interesting paper that I found recently by a Russian uh, optimizer, Fatkov, I think is his name, where, where he talks about the pioneering contributions in the Russian community by um, Yabukovic and, and you know, that generation that somehow uh, built uh, the, the foundations of you know, the kind of results we now identify with machine learning. And then Sivenko, I don't know, maybe he was a descendant of that community, what he said, well, if you take a sigma is sigma, it's just a function that takes values zero at minus infinity and one plus infinity. It doesn't really matter how it is in between. You think on a, on a nice continuous function like a arc tangent or something like this, right? Uh, and then you build such a composition with an arbitrary number of you know, terms n. What is really important is that you have the three coefficients in hand you can do that in Rn, in the Euclidean space of dimension n, but just to fix ideas, just do it in 1D. You need to be allowed to translate this function, so to be able to fix its center of gravity. You have to be allowed to squeeze the variable x, you know, to do a scaling in x, right? And then once you have such a sigma of y x plus theta, you are allowed to combine, you know, linearly as many as you wish then this set of functions is dense in the space in any, in any reasonable space, right? LP, continuous functions, and so on. And then when you look at the proof, the proof is by contradiction. It's a beautiful proof. It says, assume this set is not dense. Then there is a function that is orthogonal to all of them, think in L2. If this function is orthogonal to all of them, is in particular orthogonal to every sigmoid, right? 
translate it where you wish and stretch as much as you wish. If you pass to the limit, you can make the front of the sigmoid to be just a heavy side function. Then eventually what you are showing is that F is orthogonal to the characteristic function of every half line. It means that F is a function that is vanishing the mean of F, the integral of F is vanishing in every half line. Half line to the left, half line to the right, but also place wherever you want. And this implies that F is equal to zero, right? Simply because in order to see that F is equal to zero, it is sufficient to know that the integral of F is zero in, in an interval, right? And then you can, of course, build an interval around that point just by looking to the intersection of lines to the, la to the, to the half lines to the left and to the right. So it's a very elementary proof. It's, it's a beautiful one. And this is one of the you know, results that is more systematically quoted in the, in the theory of neural networks and machine learning, because it basically says that everything can be approximated by those objects, right? And once you know that it can be approximated by the, those objects, then you can say, based on that, I can approximate all these, PDEs, uh, whatever I want, okay? Good. So these are how the sigmoids look. There is a, a, a different kind of sigmoid, which is very popular, is the ReLU. The ReLU, it doesn't really fulfill the conditions of Sibenko because it's zero to the left and then linear. Therefore, the limit to the right goes to plus infinity. But it's not difficult to see that the proof of Sibenko is actually, you know, also with some variations working for the ReLU function. And when you think of what you are doing, when building such combinations, you realize that actually you are building approximations, regular approximations of simple functions, piecewise constant functions, that as we know from our you know, first courses in measure theory, they are dense, right? So in fact, once you think a little bit on what they are doing, you realize, well, this is just the density of simple functions, then of course the result is true, right? So the key point is that once you, you realize that this is true, I mean, uh, you have to learn how to compute these coefficients, theta, y, and alpha, and this is not that easy, right? I mean, if you give me theta and y, I know how to compute alpha because this is just a linear projection. But computing theta and y is a nonlinear optimization problem, right? In high dimension becomes uh, very technical. And this is why, despite such a universal theorem, approximation theorem exists, uh, the manipulation of those uh, neural networks is not necessarily that easy and requires to, to employ all the tools we know from nonlinear <clears throat> optimization. Okay, so what is the application? One of the most classical applications is supervised learning. I mean, this is a, an exercise that, uh, you know, is getting, I think this is the German influence, right? So we are getting, it's getting more and more complicated in every country, right? So I think in in Bilbao, there are now like five containers, right? So here in Germany, we have like also four or five, right? So anyhow, we like to build a, a you know, a machine, a, a black box, a, a function that is able to classify trash, right? And we know that sometimes it's very obvious, right? This is a plastic bottle that goes to, you know, to yellow, and this is glass that goes to green. In some other cases, things are not so obvious. Sometimes you have a bag with a kind of a composite new material. It's hard to say whether it's paper, plastic. Okay, anyhow, we like to do it in an automatic manner. So this means that we have to build a function, right? Which is taking every item that is living in a Euclidean space of dimension D, you can think of it as being a, an image, right? Or just a shape in 2D, wherever you want. So you embed all these objects as points in a very large dimensional space. And then you want to build a nonlinear function that is able to take any of these items and put it in the correct, say, uh, basket. Okay. And, and the idea of doing that, you know, for a large number of items is that hopefully once you have learned and you have built such a function, then whenever someone brings you you know, a new item, you don't even need to look at it. You simply put it in this machine and the machine will tell you, okay, this should be a go to yellow or to blue, right? Is that like when you 
when you retard the bottles in the supermarkets here in Germany, you don't need to say whether it's plastic or it's glass, right? So the machine immediately identifies and say, oh, this is glass, eight cents, this is plastic, 25 cents. Okay, this is what we are trying to do. Now, once you think in these terms, you say, well, this looks very close to control problems if you think on it in a, in a dynamical manner, right? And, and this is indeed the case, this was observed Already soon after the paper by Sivenko, there was a paper by Sontag and then another paper of Sontag with Sussman, where they what they did was to say, well, these sigmoid nonlinearities are very interesting. They are not the ones we typically find in, in, in mechanics, right? Nonlinearities in mechanics don't look like a sigmoid. You don't have zero to one side and then nearly one to the other. You think more on polynomial, quadratic, whatever, sinusoidal nonlinearities in, you know, in the classical problems in, in astronautics and so on, right? There will be pl plenty of trigonometric functions. They are not sigmoids, but they did the controllability of that problem. Why not? It's a nonlinear dynamics you can build out of that uh, sigmoid. Uh, later on, it was observed that actually there is a clear link between Sibenko, uh, deep learning, and the kind of problems that Sussman and Sontag started, uh, say, analyzing. And, and is the point of view of the residual neural networks uh, where you say, well, rather than, you know, considering just piling up sigmoids as Sivenko did, right? People thought, well, rather than piling up in a very tall column, right, column, let me, you know, uh, chop off, you know, limit, the height of this column and rather repeat, you know, the application of the sigmoid in several, say, layers, right? And then if you do that, you will find uh, such a, you know, nonlinear iteration in which you are doing a little bit like Sibenko, but then composing sigma again and again and again, right? But with the hope of being able to do that in a, in a given dimension without going too much, you know, piling up, you know, and going to infinity. And you can do that in an incremental manner. If you do that in an incremental manner with a small parameter h, you get a discrete dynamical system that you immediately identify with this nonlinear dynamical system. And now you say, well, this is an ODE, fine. It's, indeed, it's an ODE that is unusual because you know the nonlinearity is, is given by this sigmoid. I can identify the parameters that I could choose in my time discrete iteration or in the time continue, say evolution, BT, AT matrix and WT matrix, I can identify them with uh, control parameters. And then uh, I can analyze the controllability of that problem. This was done basically by Sontag and Sussman. But now when you think in the application that we have here, you realize that this is not a classical control problem. The difference with respect to classical control theory being that this time, I want the same dynamical system with the same controls to be able to control, right? All this initial data, a collection of initial data, capital N, right? N being the number of items to be classified. I need the same controls to control simultaneously all this initial data so that each initial data goes to the corresponding, say, if you want, you can identify, you know, these baskets as uh, some reservoirs in, in the Euclidean space RD to which each trajectory will go. So this becomes a monster, a giant simultaneous control problem. Of course, simultaneous control problems are hard to solve. Normally, if you do linear theory, this will never work, right? If you build a control going, you know, for an AB linear system from X0 to X1, uh, U is good for X0 to X1, but then if you change the data, you have to change the, you know, the open loop control. You have to solve, you know, your Gramian problem again and so, right? So uh, this kind of simultaneous control problem will never occur for linear problems. Why does it occur for nonlinear? Actually, as I said, here I should quote our colleague here in Erlangen, Daniel Tembrick, who was the one who in a workshop last in September, 2019 uh, in Erlangen who about Tarpike who indicated, well, maybe you should look the possible application of Tarpike 
to this kind of systems. And this is something we do, we did, right? Um, we did it, you know, uh, in just by, without going too much into the theory, just applying the ideas of Tarpai. The ideas of Tarpai are that if you have controllability, right? And then you solve an optimal control problem where here the vector of control U simply, uh, you know, is gathering the three controls of my system, the BT, the AT, and the W3, right? Uh, if we minimize a cost functional penalizing the controls, but also penalizing not only the arrival point, but the trajectory for all time, if the time is long enough, then the TARPI property anticipated by von Neumann is satisfied. And this means, and this means that the control trajectory will be, you know, nearly steady for most of the time duration. So we did the numerical test, and this is what we saw. Okay, and we said, well, yeah, I mean, it looks correct, right? So because indeed there is some, an initial phase in which, you know, the trajectory oscillates a little bit, the controls and the trajectory oscillate, but then you see how, you know, I am able to classify like in a soccer game, you know, the blues and the reds to the left and to the right properly. So, you know, not only we see that this seems to work, but actually it seems to behave as control theory anticipates in a way that when I penalize the trajectory during the whole time interval, I indicate the objective, the objective being red to the left, blue to the right, right? The control problem is able to find a control strategy so that all the trajectories simultaneously go to the correct places. Well, all but one, right? Of course, this but one, you can improve it a little bit by penalizing maybe the final objective, you know, differently. I just wanted to show you that you have to be careful. It doesn't work always, right? You have to penalize correctly to make it work. In order to compare this with the behavior of, uh, you know, maybe the most uh, stride forward application of these ideas of neural ordinary differential equations, right? We call them neural ordinary differential equations because they are coming from, you know, this idea of residual neural network, which is just an, you know, time discrete application of the sigmoid. If you now solve the optimal control problem in a more classical manner, just minimize the cost of arriving to the final target, penalizing the control, but not penalizing the integral during the whole time interval. Now you see what happens and indeed is successful again but you see some more iterations, uh, more, more uh, oscillations in the trajectory, okay? So once we saw this, we said, well, what's going on, right? Because we know, and you know, Lars uh, is, uh, is, is one of the persons that has more contributed to this uh, uh, theory of Tarpai, that you have to be careful. I mean, the intuition is that in long time intervals, optimal control problems behave in a steady state manner. But this is not for free, right? You need somehow the system to be controllable or stabilizable and, and also, you know, to be detectable in, in the sense that, you know, both the uh, forward system and the adjoint system have to be well behaved from a control perspective, dynamical control perspective. So to see, you know, the TARPI property that we were observing. So why do we see the TARPI property? Well. Uh, and my goal here is to explain to you that, in fact, because the nonlinearity in this neural lobby is, is the sigmoid, in particular the re loop, zero to one side and then linear on the other, this kind of neural lobby is really fulfill the property of nonlinear simultaneous control that is so difficult to achieve for standard systems in discrete, uh, I mean, uh, classical or continuum mechanics. And the idea I would like to explain to you, but you know uh, certainly this better, is that in fact, what we are going to show is that you can really prove the uniform simultaneous controllability of these monster problems thanks to the very properties of the sigmoid, right? Because they are behaving like the Rubik's cube, okay? So what do I mean by this? 
before I go further, let me really show you that the videos we have presented, I mean, they are very robust, right? You do it even in 3D and you see the same phenomena, right? The result is independent of the Euclidean space dimension you are working, depending how many items you have to classify. So far, we have only, you know, two colors, two elements, paper and, you know, and plastic. You could do it also with three different items, you know, paper, plastic, and glass. It still works, right? So this seems to really show that there is a lot of robustness on, you know, these nonlinear uh, neural differential equations, and they really seem to have surprisingly strong controllability properties, right? So you see, in some cases, the trajectories oscillate more than the others. And this is simply due to the fact that we penalize the functional differently. So to look for tar pike or not, right? And then, but you see, it's always very successful. So what's going on? What is the theorem behind that guarantees that nonlinear differential equations driven by the sigmoids have such a, you know, a strong, unusual, unexpected to some extent, simultaneous control property. Okay, so I mentioned the, the Rubik cube. This is what I mean. Let me just show you, but because this is basically the proof. The proof is what I'm going to do now, plus induction. Let me just think that, you know, forget by now about the, you know, the, the ODEs, just solve this very, very simple, say, graphic exercise. I give you, now nine elements, three blue, three red, three green. And I tell you, well, the blue should go to this, you know, reservoir, the red here and the greens there. Everyone understands that. When I check, I see, well, the, the two blues will go directly in parallel, also the greens, also more or less the red. Oh, but there is one that is badly placed. Okay. And now I have to somehow do the exercise or taking this blue getting it out of the flock or the crowd of reds and place it in the group of the blues upward. How do I do that? Well, you have the sigmoid. What does the sigmoid do? You remember the sigmoid, the relu, is a function that is zero to one side and linear on the other. But then because you have these parameters in Sibenko notation theta, y, and alpha, in our notation b, w, and a, because you have these parameters, you can place the center of gravity of the sigmoid where you wish. And then you can orient, you know, in R2, you can orient also the, you know, the equator that is dividing the space into two on the way you like. So let me take this hyperplane, right? Uh, maybe this is uh, later, right? Let me, let me do the following exercise. I take the hyperplane a little bit above the badly placed blue, okay? Then when I take this hyperplane, I say the upper hemisphere is frozen and the lower hemisphere, when I use the neural ODE in which I am simply saying X prime is equal to a matrix times sigma, will evolve, you know, according to the ODE, basically up to the matrix W, x prime equal x, because sigma here is just linear. So it's evolving in an exponential manner. Now with the matrix I have in front of the, you know, on the, of the sigmoid, I can make, right, you know, the upper hemisphere go left while the lower hemisphere is frozen. And in this way, what you see is that, oh, these four guys have gone to the left while this other package here are frozen. Now I put the equator below. I push the lower hemisphere to the left, right? And you see how the right one remains isolated to the right. Now I put the equator vertically to the left of the blue. I push forward and I have the blue now that is correctly you know, placed on the corresponding layer. So what I have shown you is that if you have to classify correctly one item, in this example, it is sufficient to take controls which are piecewise constant and in three constant pieces of control with two jumps, 
you know, the classification has been achieved, right? Now, what I'm doing here, as I said, this is the neural OB, and the game I have played has been to choose B, A, and W piecewise constant. B is the drift parameter that allows me to place the equator where I wish. The A is the one that is allowing me to orient the equator the way I wish, right? In particular, horizontally or vertically. And the W1 and the W here is the one that is telling me in the active hemisphere in which direction the wind will flow, okay? And then in this way, you know, in particular, you can produce all these motions, for instance, right? I could take this equator as I wish in an oblique manner, place where I wish, but in particular, just to give you an idea, if I place it horizontally here on the X axis, I could make the wind flow to the north, to the east, to the south, or I mean, west and east, okay? In the four directions, but I could also make it flow in an oblique manner, okay? Then once you have realized this, you could say, well, uh, Enrique, you have placed the blue here, but there is a lot of dispersion in, this cl in these clouds. I would like, you know, these points to be, you know, really clustered together. Doesn't really matter. You can continue your exercise. And then you realize that if you place, for instance, the walls vertically, and then you put the wind going towards the wall, then eventually you will succeed on making every, you know, every class of points to be clustered on a, a small, say, uh, basket, okay? So this means that not only you can classify, but you can classify as precisely as you wish, okay? Now, I did the proof with just one item. If you have to classify N items, I will do it in an inductive manner, and my theorem will say, give me any time interval. I divide this time interval in a number of pieces of the order of N, and then operating in every, you know, interval with, uh, say, you know, if you are in D dimensions with D different, say, piecewise constant controls with a complexity of the order of N, you will be able to classify all of them, right? And, and if you are very, very demanding and you want the classification to be very precise so that items of the same class go to a very narrow set, you can also do it, right? Because once you have achieved classification, it's just you know a matter of compressing a little bit the matter to make sure they you know every every cluster is located in the corresponding place. Okay, this is what the theorem says. Now, as I said, I can take the time interval as I wish. Why? Because in the first proof we take the eventually the time interval very long, but then you can play by scaling. Of course, by scaling you will pay a W that is large, right? But by scaling, you can always pack your, say, control switching, jumping, bang, bang, like control strategy within a given time interval of unit length. Okay. Now, when you see the proof, you say, well, uh, you know, it took me like 50 years to get there, right? Because when I was a kid with seven years, I was, I was able to solve this exercise, right? So, I mean, you are given this toy and then you have to order the numbers. And then you know that if you have a blank place so that you can play with uh, you know, the correct placement, there are many possible strategies to do it, but certainly everyone could do it quite rapidly with different, say, uh, maybe approaches uh, to order this point. This is what we are doing. Just motions which are horizontal and vertical. So the result I have proved is, I mean, when you write it down, it's a bit longer, but it sets exactly what I told you. you know, Give me any Euclidean space of dimension two, not in one, because otherwise points cannot cross. Give me any space dimension D greater than two, two or greater than two. Allow me to use the ReLU. Then let me play with this algorithm in an inductive manner. Give me as many points, capital N, you want to classify in as many classes M as you wish. The classes can be even points, right? Provided they are different, of course, because you cannot succeed with, a, with an ODE of placing two different points sitting in the same, you know, collocation, right? But you can give me N different destinations and I can control simultaneously this system with a control that has the complexity of the order of number N jumps 
Therefore, in particular, it's a control that is in L infinity and in BV. Now, you ask me, is the construction you have done here optimal? Well, certainly it's not, because I'm sure in many situations, you could enjoy, for instance, of the fact that you didn't choose the, you know, the hyperplane to be horizontal or vertical, you choose it you know, diagonally, and then maybe your algorithm will be faster. Or for instance, here, if I had to classify these two points, right, in my inductive algorithm in which I am working point by point, I'm not using the fact that whenever points are clustered, right, I can enjoy of that option. So to really, you know, move together a small basket of points and then reduce the complexity and the number of jumps I have to perform on the control, right? Okay. Now, uh, in fact, what is the complexity of the algorithm we are using? Well, basically what, what you need to do is simply to tell me a priori, how do you separate the points in different colors by hyperplanes? And once you give me this kind of separation, I know that with each hyperplane, I have to play the same game, right? So in some sense, the minimal number of switches or jumps we will need in our control algorithm to be able to classify will be like, you know, in these uh, algorithms of, I think it's support vector machine, right? Where, where you say, well, I have to separate points with hyperplanes or like in here with a Voronoi diagram. Of course, we could say, what is the optimal strategy? Well, the optimal strategy will be given by Pontry again, right? I will have to determine in which sense I want to be optimal. Maybe I will say, well, out of all the possible controls that are driving all the initial data into the all given final configurations in Taiwan, I will take the control, for instance, of minimal BV norm. This will be characterized by a Pontryagin system with an adjoint system and so on, but it will be very hard to interpret, right? What we have done previously using numerical simulations is to observe that this works. What we have done now is to give you a proof, right? that this certainly works. But understanding the optimal control strategies is very much related to understanding uh, the, all the possible, say, uh, clustering possibilities, right? And what the, you know, the, the, the optimal way of classifying them will be, okay? So now a remark, which is more or less obvious. Uh, this was present also in many of the talks in the workshop concerning Koopman, we know that ODEs are just the solutions of the ODE are just the characteristics of the corresponding transport equation. So we could say for the same price, listen, I build this neural transport equation. By neural transport, I'm just talking about a linear transport equation in which the vector field rather than being arbitrary, is just given by this kind of sigmoid class. I consider this neural of this, a neural transport equation. And then because I am able to, you know, in the ODE, bring the initial data simultaneously from wherever locations I am given to any destination, it means that I am able to control simultaneously an arbitrary number of characteristics. And therefore this means that in this neural transport equation, I am able to transport, say, uh, atomic masses, atomic measures into atomic measures, provided they have the same density, right? And the way to measure this, as you know, is, is for instance, Wasserstein one, right? So this is what I'm saying. You give me three points, for instance, initially, three points as destination. I know that the ODE is controlling these three trajectories simultaneously to the corresponding destination. And then because of that, of course, if you give me the transport equation and you consider the initial data, which is constituted by simply the direct masses sitting here with the corresponding weights, then the transport equation will drive this atomic measure into the corresponding final atomic measure. So maybe you are not satisfied by this because it's true that I can bring S1 into a, a Y1, but of course, all the mass of X1 will be transferred to Y1. I'm not able to redistribute mass. I'm not able to redistribute wealth, 
So if you really want to do optimal transport, you have to be able to, well, optimal, not optimal transport, just transport in a more, say, uh, generous manner, right? You have to be able to split the mass. How can you split the mass according to our results? You can do it a priori, right? So if you tell me that finally you want a, a more complex redistribution of mass, so that is not simply that every individual in the end is taking the full mass of one other individual in the beginning, but things are reorganized. What you need to do is initially you have to split the mass into two small masses. You can of course do it so that the two masses, the green ones are sitting as close as you wish to the red one. And so that this mass initially M1 in the red point is distributed as you wish, is split as you wish into two submasses. You can do it in an arbitrary manner. And then again, because I can control as many trajectories as I wish in the ODE, I can transport now the, the new distribution of direct deltas into a new final distribution of direct deltas. In this case, I will have the small error of, uh, say, breaking one mass into two. And this is an approximate control result for the neural transport equation in the Wasserstein distance one, right? Because you are paying the price of the approximation of the support of the direct deltas, which is the quantity that Wasserstein one is, is, is seeing, right? Uh, being a measure, right? Or a distance within the space of measures that is finer than the classical one we impose by simply using test functions that are uh, continuous and bounded, okay? So, uh, the same ideas, uh, you know, allow you to consider more general situations where you have a continuous distribution row zero that you want to transport into a continuous distribution row one. This is a simplification of how we will do it, right? But then the idea is that if you want to drive row zero into row one, you could do it in the, you know, the transport equation, right? Uh, is time reversible. You can move forward and backward. And then the, the only thing you need to do is to say, well, out of row zero, I will show you how I bring this mass into a given number of points. The only thing I need to do is to take the unit mass below row zero. I divide it into say N pieces of mass one over N, and then provided I able to you know, cut it down, right? Into these N pieces, I will say, what does it exactly mean? I will take each of these pieces and using the same arguments as before, I will be able to compress and transport to the location I want. I could do it also from the final time towards in the intermediate one. And in this way, I will build a path that is able to, in an approximate manner, in the sense of Wasserstein one, bring the initial mass row zero into row one, following this neural transport equation, just simply because I reinterpreted the, the very properties of uh, universal approximation in terms of dynamic control of all these, right? So uh, here I'm talking about interfaces. And when you look carefully about, for instance, universal approximation, which is a corollary also, you know, as an output of this result, you could give a different proof of universal approximation. This is part of the work we have done with uh, Domenech Ruiz in this uh, paper that is now also in our kit, right? Um, one of the corollaries of all this is that, okay, we can reprove universal approximation. Of course, this proof is much more complicated, right? So if I was uh, to give a recommendation of, uh, you know, a simple proof, please use Sivenko. Now, if you want a control uh, theoretical dynamical system proof, well, uh, this is what you can do. And I think it will be hard to do better, right? Because in particular, when you try to use the ideas of universal approximation, uh, sorry, when you want to use these ideas in order to get universal approximation, you really observe that depending on the function you are trying to approximate, this is a very simplified case where you have a nice disk, it's just the characteristic function of a disk. So there is a perimeter, right? Of course, you have to approximate the perimeter of the disk by interfaces. And this means, you know, producing, if you want a really an epsilon approximation, you will have to produce a very, very, you know, 
closely approximating polygonal and then the number of steps will grow. But you realize that this is much better than such a configuration because in such a configuration, every time you are mixing blue and, and, and red, you need to split by interfaces. And of course, if you will take here, for instance, the, you know, the, the, the characteristic function of a Cantor or a Mandelbrot set, because the, you know, the, 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 the boundary you know, is oscillating very, very rapidly, right? The perimeter is infinity. The, the boundary is thick. Then the number of steps you will have to produce is very huge. And the reason for that is that, of course, you know, whenever you want to split, you have to identify the neighboring boundary. This is just an example, right? So how do we show that using uh, neural ODEs and the uniform control result we have proved, how do you show that you can approximate such a function? So such a function is a function that is very simple, is zero in the blue and red and, and one in the red. How do I build an approximation using this ODE? You see, this ODE is very naive. Once you give me the B, the A, and the W, the ODE phi prime equal, you know, blah, 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 is simply taking an initial datum X, right? And then driving this initial datum to the corresponding final destination. My claim is that wherever the time capital T is, I can build B, A, and W so that whenever you solve this ODE for every single X in R2, the function you will get at the final time will be a function that is taking one value in the blues and in another value in the red, meaning that I have really reproduced, you know, the characteristic function pattern I wanted to a price, the price being that I have to be able to break, right? And be able to cut off with the scissors. I have to be able to do this exercise of cutting the red patch and remove it from the blue. And in order to do that, I, I have to, you know, break this here and then eliminate the perimeter. Of course, I can take a neighborhood that is as thin as, as you wish, right? This will be epsilon thin. But then you realize that in order to approximate this by hyperplanes, if you are in a very complex situation like in the Mandelbrot set, then the number of cuts will be huge, right? But in this particular case, the idea goes that way. You split this into two, right? And then you start operating as I did with the neural ODEs by saying I take a hyperplane and I push this blue up. I take another hyperplane, I place, I, I, you know, I push this blue up and so on, so that you are able to separate, you separate, and once they are separated, you can compress, and then you can bring these patches as close as you wish to two different points in the Euclidean space, which means that I can really make, right, given me, give me any epsilon, give me any epsilon, I will be able to guarantee that there is a B, an A, and a W so that the solution of this ODE for every X ends up going to an arbitrarily small neighborhood of this point or that point, preserving the color. And this is precisely the universal approximation theorem, at least in the LP context. Of course, we are not able to do it with continuous functions, right? Because you know, uh, you know, continuous functions. I mean, I am introducing here singularities that will not be able to to approximate continuous functions. Okay, just to conclude, uh, comments. I think this is a, a very interesting topic. There is plenty to be done. Probably some of the most interesting things to be done are related to the fact that I didn't bring here any drawing of uh, of neural network, right? But you all have in mind these uh, deep neural networks in which the width is jumping from one layer to another, right? Which means that um, I think I didn't bring any, no, any drawing, right? <clears throat> but you know that deep neural networks not only are evolving in a discrete iteration, but they are also jumping like an accordion, right? How you say accordion in English? An accordion, this is, is accordion? Yes. How do accordion, Dante? No, accordion, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Accordion, right? So it's like an accordion, right? So you are 
you are, you know, compressing and, and pulling, uh, you know, the width of the neural network. This, from a dynamic perspective in the context of these neural ODEs here, it will mean that you are not really solving an ODE in a given Euclidean space of dimension D, but that you are allowed to jump in dimension going up and down. And understanding why this is any better is something that so far we didn't do. But this is actually, when you look to our proof, which works in any dimension, what you realize is that actually in order to address this issue, what you need to understand, and maybe there is probably in the audience, there is someone that can help me on this. What you really need to understand is uh, how given a cloud of points, how the number of interfaces you need in order to separate them into clusters can vary when, for instance, rather than working in R2, you decide to move all these points to R3. So the question is whether we can understand that using linear extensions or projections, right, the same cloud of points extended, extrapolated to a higher dimensional space or projected into a lower dimensional space can benefit of the fact that the clustering improves and then the number of interfaces you need to separate decreases. Because as soon as I know that the number of interfaces has decreased, our proof works in any dimension and therefore will give you a simplified control strategy to produce the classification result, which is on the basis of, of neural transport and also universal approximation in the end. So probably this is the, the most uh, challenging and, and interesting result in this context. Of course, there will be many other topics related to, you know, to the possible extension of these ideas to more challenging problem like uh, unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning. So here we simply address the problem of supervised learning classification. I assume that I know what is the label of every point and just I show you, you can do it, right? If you just give me a few labels, I will classify those points the others, I will be blinded. I will not have any information. So I will not be able to do anything. So you have to really add up other tools if you want to go beyond the supervised learning paradigm to others. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Enrique. It's a great, wonderful talk. Um, I guess we have a few questions from the audience. I don't know who wants to begin. Yeah. Is anybody wants to sir? Um, okay, uh, I, I can start any case. Uh, I, I find these links with optimal transport super, super interesting actually. It's a, uh, uh, but I wonder when you go back to the, to the transport equation, yeah, one slide back, yes. Uh, this is already like in the Venamou Renier formulation, no? It's already like a, uh, oh, yeah. as a, a fluid flow problem, right? Right, right. right. Um, you think with yeah, people- This is the control, right? So you see that this is a kind of bilinear control. This is what we were discussing with Sebastian yesterday, right? Because now the control is centered in, in the vector field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there is a further parameterization because in the original formulation, you would just have a, a generic vector field. There is not the one with the particular parameterization that you are gaining by having a neural network. Precisely, right? precisely, yeah. yeah. My question, yeah. uh, here I have two questions. First, if, if you go now to the Naumwen formulation, the solution of this would be this couple with the hamilton jago equation for the, okay. that would be the solution of this problem, which of course then we enter again the curse of dimensionality because this will govern by the, the dimension right. of the data that you want to. But can, can you go back? Do you think you can go back to the, say, monsch kantoroi formulation where you really, instead of working with the PDE, now you work with the linear programming formulation of this? Because then you can do entropic regularization and, and sort of numerical methods that are much that could effectively scale in, in, for high dimensional settings. No? So I, I think it's my question. Do you think that from this Venamuwe formulation would it be possible to go to a more general uh, optimal transport formulation? 
I confess we didn't really think uh, too much on this. We were just, you know, what we did really we worked hard in order to understand what are the limitations of what we can do, right? So the first thing I have to say is that we are not able to do exact transport, right? We always have some loss. And we have some loss because we have to put interfaces, right? So in particular, we have to separate, you know, the blue and the red, and then there is you, you pay a, a small volume around the perimeter. So the first thing is that the result is weaker. It doesn't say you go from any initial density to any final density. What we say, we can do it in an approximate manner. This is the first point. The second point, of course, is that we can do it with vector fields that, you know, they are much more limited than simply being, you know, optimal in the class of Lipschitz vector fields. They are of a very, very particular class, right? And um, the, the third comment is that the way we understand that is not by a transport theory argument, but rather going back to the ODE. And this was precisely the spirit of my question yesterday to Sebastian and also to, you know, previous questions and my concerns about all these Kubman theories that I understand that you can make nonlinear ODEs to look linear in the transport context, but if you really want to gain a, an in-depth understanding of the, of the transport phenomena, you have to go back to the characteristics. So now going back to your question, really Dante, I don't know how much else uh, I could say. Now, if you ask me about optimality, I will go here back to optimality here, and then I will write on again. but this will be a monster. There is again by working with the density there instead of the microscopic data, say, say with, the, with the particles. So maybe working with the density things, uh, right? So you say you work with the density, but with the constraint that is imposed by this kind of vector fields, this is your idea? Well, I don't have any precise idea. I wonder, I, I'm just thinking about the computational viewpoint that when you are right. in that formulation, you go back to the Monsch Cantoroy formulation and you write this as a linear program. And this is something that can be solved very, very efficiently, actually. So, um, uh, yes, that's that's maybe, my only comment. Maybe, I maybe, maybe. I, I was more thinking on, yeah, maybe you are right. So maybe I was just thinking on the other sense, right? Of seeing, okay, so, uh, they say, okay, I take this problem, but with a general vector field, and then I impose the optimality condition of the vector field for the transport, right? So we could do the same within this class. This will lead you to a, a kind of different uh, optimality condition, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So if, if you really adopt the same perspective of, uh, of uh, Brenier Benamou, which is in their functional, they do what? They basically uh, minimize the kinetic energy, right? Of the transport uh, plan yes. or something yeah. like this, right? Yeah, you write it as a control problem, basically. And, and... Right, right. So if you do that under the constraint that the vector field has to look that way, what happens? Do you gain anything with respect to doing a, a large country again here? I don't know. Yeah, I, I I would guess that by by doing a further parameterization, this is this is is tailored for your problem, so it should be better than just doing the generic vector field there that that you optimize. I don't I don't know. It's a right. So of course, I mean, uh, all these are very interesting questions. One has to think carefully on this. In in some sense, you could say, well, uh, you know, if I simply tell the 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 corollary what we prove, people could say, Enrique, what you did is trivial. And they will be right. Why? Because, you know, if there is a vector field that is generating the optimal transport, you could always use Sibenko and say, well, Sibenko already told me that, you know, sigmoids are able to generate by density any kind of function. So, so you could simply take any result in the theory of optimal transport plus Sibenko, and then you could do, you could say immediately, well, if you do optimal transport, I do nearly optimal transport using neural networks. So in some sense, the conclusion is empty, except that, you know, the, the way of proving can have some interesting consequences. But uh, 
maybe we can talk uh, about this if you have some time tomorrow, Dante. No, no, I would like to to understand your question better. Yeah, before I pass to the next question, just let me say that if you go back to the Namuria formulation, I think this is also interesting because now you are almost nearby midfield games, you know, and, and if and if you're thinking about turnpikes, you also have turnpike results. With, uh, I think it's by yourself and, and Porreta, no, on, on, on turnpike. Yeah, I mean, this games. is, yeah, actually, you know, turnpike, I mean, this is an old uh, history, but, uh, but I, I mean, turnpike, I was shocked. I remember I was... Uh, orienting a PhD in Autonomy in Madrid was like 15 years back. Uh, Francisco Palacios, he's now working in in uh, in California in Boeing, right? He's engineer there, and he was writing a PhD in uh, optimal shape design in aeronautics. And I was always shocked that the, their formulations were always on steady state models. While you know, you ask a mathematician uh, about aeronautics, they will say, "Oh, Navi stocks and Navi stocks for us is a uh, the, the most paradigmatic dynamical system. So for us, controlling flows is a dynamical problem. Why are they doing it in the in the steady state configuration? And it was once uh, I invited Alessio Porretta to Bilbao, he gave a talk and he started talking about minfield games and he has shown this kind of results they have you know, found in which they have kind of an intermediate after two boundary layers at t equals zero and t equals t, they had an steady state, uh, say, behavior. And this is where I realized that this is the result I was, I was looking for, right? And, and once our paper was written, it was one of the kind referees um, that um, of the paper submitted this to Cyan Journal of Control who said, well, the paper is very nice, but maybe they should have a look to the Tarpike theory. And then we discovered that this was uh, something that it was already observed many years ago by von Neumann and Samuelson. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Tarpike arises also in, in this context of uh, transport equation related to mean field games, optimal transport, and so on, right? Yes. So somehow the result, I didn't get into the details there, but in the first paper with Borjan Geskowski, Carlos Esteve, and Dario Pigin, what we did was to show that if the neural ODE has the simultaneous controllability property, the tarpike arises. Now with the result uh, we proved with Dominic, we know this neural ODE has the controllability property, then putting it together with the first paper, we can explain that this indeed has the property of Tarpai. And because this has the property of Tarpai, of course, the flatness of the control that becomes a steady, you know, in, in between the initial and the final time, this is something you will also observe in the neural transport. So you are right. A corollary uh, Dante will be that uh, the neural transport equation also enjoys the property of Tarpai. Thanks for the very the, yeah. It's very very interesting actually. So let's let's move on with the other people who want to ask questions. Uh, Yekun, please, can you can you want to ask first? Um, yes, a very nice talk, Eric. So I have considered that I have tried to understand deep learning from this this kind of control perspective since my PhD study, and your work is very illuminating to me. Um, uh, so I have questions related to the open question you you, you raised at the end. I think uh, so. If I understand correctly, um, the current result you gave um, is based on certain partition of the the, the 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 points, and then you can provide prove some universal approximation of the the partition, and then you you raised okay. Um, how can we how can we find uh, some partition with low complexity? Uh, right. which is very important because in practical, we are not only interested in the universal approximation, but uh, the certain approximation rates um, given the given the target function. So I think this approximation rates relates to the complexity of the, the, the partition uh, very much. And uh, then, um, and of course, whether we are allowed to, to, to lift the, the, the dimension of the state variable also, uh, affects the complexity very much. So uh, I'm wondering, in order to consider this kind of problems, in your opinion, will it be easier to work in the 
in the regression setting instead of class classification setting because in the regression setting i think you also mentioned that okay uh how complex the 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 the, the, the country is is um is related to how how can we construct some piecewise constant functions so i'm wondering for regression problems do we have some can we come up with some criterion to see uh the complex of to i mean can we put up some complexity criterion to to deal with these opposing rates with this control perspective yeah and so uh, you got it right right so well probably uh if I say that probably Kolmogorov did it, uh, probably I am right. Uh, now, I will not be able to, to indicate a reference or how. I mean, I, I, we need to think a little bit more to come out with a concrete uh, answer to this. But I think it's very much like, you see, Kolmogorov complexity, that is, you know, Kolmogorov complexity is uh, to say, OK, I have compact sets in an infinite dimensional space. Okay, compact set in an infinite dimensional space is not far from sets that, that I can approximate by finite dimensional objects. And Kolmogorov came with this very interesting idea of Kolmogorov thickness that says, give me a compact set in an infinite dimensional space, right? And then I will give you, I will tell you what is the, the, the thickness by simply, you know, you give me an epsilon. And then I tell you what is the dimension n of the hypercube I need, so to make sure that this compact set fits into the n-dimensional cube just by leaving epsilon mass outside. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you see how, for instance, uh, the unit ball on Sobolev spaces when embedded into L2, which of course they are all compact, you see that you know, the Kolmogorov thickness of these compact sets really depends on the Sobolev regularity, right? Or, or you look simply, you know, the unit ball of the space of functions of class CK, right? In the, in the space of continuous function C0, the unit ball in CK, when embedded into C0, this will be a compact set of Kolmogorov uh, uh, thickness that will be of the order of uh, something like one over K or so, right? Because of course, the more regularity you have, right? Uh, the less thickness, right? The more the more compactness you have. So I think this is the kind of ideas we need. So the only thing I will need to to uh, to give a, a, a say optimal statement will be give me uh, give me any class of initial data, but please tell me what is the complexity of this class of initial data in the sense that if you allow me to remove epsilon percent of them, right? Then I know I can separate them with, you know, capital N depending on epsilon interfaces. Because then if you are able to do that, I tell you, I don't mind how many points there are. You see, I didn't ask you how many points there are. You give me as many points as you wish. You put as many as you wish. The only question I ask you, please tell me by removing epsilon percent, how many hyperplanes, capital N of epsilon, I will need to separate them. Then I tell you this neural body has this monster property of controlling simultaneously all this data up to this epsilon that you allow me to remove, right? with capital N switches on the control. Uh, now, in this context, if you, are, uh, if you are free with the number of data points, then I think this kind of statement will also relate to the distribution of data you sampled from certain underlying distribution, right? Because you want to remove epsilon percent of data, but what's the realization of the data you can observe will affect right. Right. To affect like the, how many points you need to remove. Right. But but this will be more related. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I confess I'm when I get to this point, I have doubts. What is the correct statement? Right. Because will this be related to the regularity of the function or or more to because we are more like talking about level sets. Right. And we know that level sets uh, you can be. I mean, you cannot track them by, by simply following uh, 
um, regularity issues, right? Or but maybe it's related to SAR theorem. I don't know, right? So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, level I have... sets can be bad, but not many level sets can be bad, right? Because uh, right, what does uh, SAR theorem says that if you take a smooth functions, most of the level sets are smooth, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I talk about the, 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 uh, some complex criteria. I think the, 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 the normal regularity in the, in the PD theorem may not be a good candidate because we know the, 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 for sublet function space, the, 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 regularity, the regularity we have is related to dimension D, but uh, it seems that for neural networks, the, 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 the its approximation power somehow is not so sensitive to the dimension of D. So I think we may need to come up with some other criteria to see, okay, how can we deal with the problems? Maybe the level set idea is one relevant thing, but yeah, I think it's a very open question and I'm happy to discuss yeah. it and the, later. Yeah, I will, I will be happy to, but I suspect, uh, Kun, that there is already a lot written in the literature that I don't know on these topics, but maybe probably in a different context. So I will not be surprised if Kol Mogorov has given the answer to this already, but um, I think he was not invited to the workshop. So, um, yeah, uh, you yeah. see, and the, and the point is, as I was trying to explain in the end, once such a concept is well defined, it is very interesting to understand how it depends on the dimension of the Euclidean space in which you decide to embed your data. Yes. Because for us, these neural lobbies, they behave the same in every dimension. It's just the complexity of the data you are feeding that obliges you to work harder or less. Yeah, I agree. So thank you very much. I think I will leave some time to other uh, people. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Igor. Uh, Peter, please, go ahead. Thank you. So yes. it's it's perhaps not Kol Mogorov who, who solved this problem, but it might be Vapnik and Chervonenkis, if uh, you heard about these names. No. Can you put the, the name on the chat or? Well, I, later if you use Peter, please go ahead. But uh, no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not familiar. I don't know anything about this. So I know this is from a lot of complexity because of the work that, I mean, we, we wrote a short paper following uh, the ideas developed by people like Ron Devore and collaborators on, on the greedy methods for solving parametric PDEs, right? So we wrote a one paper or two in which we show that the same ideas can be used in order to control uh, linear systems depending on parameters in a greedy manner, in an optimal manner in the sense of Kolmogorov. But that's all I know, basically. I'm referring back uh, to the, the same problem uh, you just discussed. So how uh, how to lift perhaps, or how many how many hyperplanes do you need for a set of points uh, minimally to to separate and optimally. This is something, although in a little bit of an inverse setting, uh, coming up in statistical learning theory, where um, there are model classes and the simplest model class is a linear separator, like you talked about uh, super vector machines. Mm -hmm. So a linear classification function is the most simple thing you can get, uh, or you could think of how, how complex is the class of all uh, linear separators is, is kind of the question which they're trying to answer uh, by going about uh, something called uh, the shatter coefficient. And this shatter coefficient then features in the theory very prominently. This shatter coefficient kind of tells you how, how rich the class is, uh, how uh, many different points you can separate with, uh, with a certain number of uh, functions from this model class. And the question you have posed seems to me very, very deeply connected to this. Thank you, Peter. Are you familiar with all this? You seem to be familiar with this. A little bit, although now I regret that I didn't uh, didn't understand this uh, this whole theory in depth, such that I could uh, tell you now. Yeah. I would probably. I, need I see here hour. Gabor Lugosi. I know I know Gabor Lugosi. He works in Barcelona. Yes. I know this name, but you see, 
Yes. This is a field that I never, I mean, for me, it has been always science fiction, right? So I never, I never approach this, uh, this community. I know Gabor, but uh, yeah. He, and, and actually, the, the, the son of um, Giavukovic is working in Autonoma uh, with us for now more than 20 years. And yeah, but I mean, I always was living in a different, say, world, right? So as I told you, Sivenko, I didn't know of the existence of the paper by Sivenko until last year. And, and I, it could have been absolutely an exercise in the master courses I took in Paris back in 84, because we were precisely doing this, you know, functional analysis, applied functional analysis, you know, following Brazil's book, that by the way, was one of the teachers there, right? So it took me 35 years to discover that this paper existed. I was even a member of the editorial board of the journal, right? So maybe, maybe you, Lars, uh, you were exposed to this kind of uh, work uh, much earlier, right? Yeah, well, much earlier, I wouldn't say, but a couple of years earlier, yeah. Yeah, I came across this, uh, I think the Sybenko paper, I, I came across first time 2005, something like that, because I had a colleague who was very much interested and we discussed these kind of issues, uh, but... Um, and actually, what I will talk about tomorrow is, in a sense, a kind of continuation of, of Sybenko. So I will build on a result that is, has been proved a little bit later, which is a kind of refinement of Sybenko's result. So, but yeah, yeah, that's, of course, that's I know there, I, are, I there has to... been plenty other, yeah, yeah, of, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just took the simplest, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I didn't follow this track. It's good that you, you explain what was done later, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think the journal owes a lot uh, to Sivenko, right? Because now, Definitely. you know, Definitely. just by this paper, you know, the number of citations in the journal, you know, like... Uh... Yeah. Okay. But I think there were other questions. So. Uh, yes. Uh, if, if either, do you don't have a question or it was it just a comment? No? It's a... We... That was kind of a question slash oh, okay. comment, uh, but uh, we can follow up on this. Okay. If, uh, yeah, I, will, I will definitely send you an email. I'm, I'm not sure I am able to understand that so easily. I'm checking in the Wikipedia and uh, yeah, I mean, this is computational learning theory and uh, probably, yeah, probably the kind of question I am, I am, I am formulating and the guess I did is probably one of the definitions that these people these people have introduced and uh, of course the, the challenge is I think to for us I mean from my perspective is to to have a way of understanding how this kind of complexity measure behaves depending on the Euclidean space in which you embed your data. Do you have yes. a guess for that Peter? For for linear um, right, linear. For right. linear classification, it's uh, so this coefficient goes, I think, like L to the D if you have L hyperplanes and uh, D dimensions, or L to the D plus one. That's what you can uh, kind of separate. So, um, in the number of so in the, in the number of points, I suppose it would be then uh, logarithmic. But uh, we can talk about it to, tomorrow, okay. perhaps. I have some material in this. I will look into it. Yeah, I, I and I can really point you to further yeah. things as well. Okay. Yeah, because I reading in the Wikipedia, I don't see well that I mentioned where is Haydn, right? So, yeah. There's a book by Lugos, is one of the authors. Um, they, they discuss this uh, at length. Yeah there, is, uh, yeah, there is this book, maybe Busquet, Boucheron, Lugosi, Introduction to Statistical Learning Theory, right? I mean, Devroy, Jurfi, Lugosi. Mm -hmm. 2000 something, 2005 perhaps. Well, here there is a book in 2004, Busquet, Boucheron, Lugosi, but maybe this is not the book, right? No. I, I don't think that's a book. Jurfi, uh, maybe it's this one. Yeah. Giorfi, De, De Vroy, and Lugosi. Exactly, yeah. that's the book. 96, is 96. Mm -hmm. um, maybe 
Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, Sebastian. we can do this offline. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, thanks for the very, very nice talk. Uh, that's, it was really, really interesting. Um, I have a much more practical question, I think, I guess, in comparison to the others. Um, regarding this varying dimension of the, the layers that you mentioned, that is an open question. Okay. Couldn't you just um, like initialize the system with a much, much higher dimensional state that has many zeros? And then you can, you know, have sparse matrices W, uh, A, and B, and then you, uh, you change the dimension to these yeah. hidden states. Yeah, this is, so, I mean, there is a paper, I think it's also in archive by uh, the two young fellows in our group, uh, Carlos Esteve and Borjan, they have done that. So they say uh, they do a sparse control, right? As, as you are suggesting, Sebastian. Okay. So they say, okay, we know we can do it. So somehow our result plays the role again of uh, a starting point. You say, okay, uh, Dominic and Enrique have proved that you can do it. Now, once you know you can do it, you can decide to choose your control parameters yeah. in an optimal way with an optimality criteria you can choose. And then what they say, we adopt the optimality criteria of uh, sparsity. So probably, I don't remember now, I think it's just minimizing the L1 norm of the controls, right? Mm -hmm. And then okay. in this way, they find the sparsity, and then you can interpret the sparsity in terms of the fact that, you know, your neural network that was given a, a, a given width, now it will be nearly empty inside, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, this is okay. what they do. But of course, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, this is, in some sense, they solve the problem, but, okay, so what we wanted is to understand better what's going on, right? Yeah. And maybe not give you, not give a, a kind of an optimal control bas ba black box approach that eventually you will need to go through Pontryagin to see what's going on, mm -hmm. but rather to explain, you know, the possible more or less uh, easy to interpret advantage of moving up and down in dimension just by playing with the same kind of ideas. By the way, I didn't mention we are not the only persons that have done things that are similar to those. After we finished our paper, it was when, when doing the last revision that we realized that there is also this uh, very interesting paper by Agra Chef and Sari Chef, right? Where they do similar things using Lee bracket theory. So they, they also understood that the simultaneous control of neural OBEs can be related to classical control theory. They rather consider sigmoids that are smooth. I mean, they don't do mm -hmm. the case of the ReLU. In our case, you see, in our case, we enjoy of the fact that we are playing with the ReLU because the ReLU is like, a, you know, it's like the French guillotine, right? That allows mm -hmm. you to freeze half of the space while the other one is moving. It's very, very clean, right? You just cut, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so because they are using Lie algebra techniques, they need to... To, to use sigmoids that are smooth. But up to this epsilon approximation that you will need on the, on the sigmoid, the results also apply. But okay. again, their proof is more uh, in the spirit of the classical proofs in control theory saying, well, I start doing Lie brackets. If I am able to fill the whole space, then the system is controllable. But what we do is actually explain, right? How, right? Basically, what we are doing by, by shifting the direction of control, we are like doing Lie brackets as well, but we try to give a much more elementary uh, explanation of the really the dynamics and the geometry of, of the minimal complexity controls you can, you can, you can use, right? Okay. But you are totally right, Sebastian. We could do a posteriori sparse control and say that this is a way of explaining the you know the success of uh, say uh, neural networks or deep neural networks with uh, varying uh, widths, right? But to my taste, this will be a little bit too much uh, implicit in some sense. Oh, okay, yeah. Huh? Thank you. But this is in the paper by Esteve and uh, and um, 
and Gieskowski that I didn't bring here on the citations. I missed many citations, I'm sorry. Probably some of the members of the audience should have been quoted uh, more also. Um, I apologize, I don't know that much of this. Thanks a lot for your answer. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Yeah, I, Lars, I have a short question. You said that you can get the uh, universal approximation theorem as a corollary. But as far as I understand, one particular feature of the original Sybenko result is that it only needs one layer of, uh, right. of sigmoid functions. Right. I, I do not think you can get this precisely, right? No. No, 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 no. We do it. Uh, so in some sense, uh, you are totally right, Lars. So I, I was vague on this. So we can do it in this context, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because yeah. if you can do it for the ODE, you take H small, then you can do it right, here. Right. So basically, I will do universal approximation through residual neural networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, fine. This is what we get as a corollary, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I think this was also our discussion session, Lars. Or, or yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. This is this is always meant to be the discussion session that uh, that that precedes or and, and not precedes follows the talk. Talk. So I, I see you sent an email with the picture, so we can we can post it on Instagram. Yeah, or yeah. And I see that now Florian is there, and he wasn't there when we took the picture. That's a real pity. So maybe, but. But now others are missing, so I'm not sure whether we gain anything if we make another photo. Yes, yes uh, that's okay. Um, nice, thank you. Who else? Okay, uh, yeah, well, I think we have to thank again Enrique and Sophie for the great talks today. And yeah. uh, shall we resume tomorrow, half past three, no? With the yeah, half past history. three, and the order is it's already on the web. If you let that look at the program, the first one is uh, Shikum, and then followed by myself and the last one then is Wei Kang in the evening. Evening here, of course, always. Indeed. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. So thank you again for your audience and um, thank you. Have a good night. See yes. you tomorrow. You too. Thank you. Yeah. See thank you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you Bye. tomorrow. Bye.